Romans 6.16. Let me read it to you. This is a very important passage to describe the difference here between the choices that you have. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned or chose to become self-dependent instead of God-dependent, they became absolutely helpless to do anything right. So now we have two choices. Let's read them. In Romans chapter 6, verse 16. <clears throat> do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience... The word obedience in the Bible means submitting yourself, subordinating your will to God or to the other force that makes anything happen on this earth. There's just two forces. When something happens to you, you don't have to wonder, I wonder why that happened. It happened because it was caused by one of the two powers, either God or Satan. Back to Romans 6.16. Do you not know... That when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you have become a slave of the one that you chose to become subordinated to. Either of sin, speaking of the condition, not of birth. Either of sin, resulting in what? Death. Or of obedience, resulting in righteousness. righteousness. Those are our two choices. If you choose to become a slave to Christ and subordinate your will to Him, look what... Paul says in verse 22 of the same chapter 6 of Romans, But now that you have been freed from the sin condition, because you've chosen to become enslaved to God, your results are sanctification. Sanctification is a very fancy word for what this lady just said of you. Holiness in your every aspect of your life. Produced by whom? The Holy Spirit to whom you have chosen to become a slave to. And the outcome is what? Eternal life. How many of you want to go to heaven? Before you go to heaven, you have to have the mindset, since you're right now living in this generation, you have to have the mindset to subordinate the will to Christ. He takes care of the results. The flesh is sinful. So the natural thing for my flesh to do is to sin. That is my nature. Remember Jeremiah 17, 9? The heart is a deceitful thing and desperately incurable. That's what the word means in Hebrew. Your version say wicked. But the original word means desperately incurable. We have a condition that is incurable, that is terminal, speaking from a spiritual standpoint. God inspires Paul to say the same thing in the New Testament in Romans 8, 7. The carnal mind is enmity against God. What does the word enmity mean? Hostile. It's two people that are at war with each other. What do people do that go to war with each other? They try to kill each other. The carnal mind is enmity against God. Number two, and not subject to the law of God. And even if it tries to be, it cannot. What a dilemma. Where is the good news in all of this? Go to verse 9 and 10 of Romans chapter 8. But you are no longer under the influence of the flesh, but of the spirit. The next word is the key. If. If means what? I have a choice to make. If so be it that the Spirit of Christ dwells in you. Because if the Spirit of Christ does not dwell in you, I don't care what day you go to church, how you fix your hair, if you wear your dresses dragging the floor, if you become a vegan in your diet. I don't care about that. You do not belong to Christ. Any confusion there whatsoever? Now the good news is verse 10. But if the Spirit of Christ dwells in you, that's your choice, then the body becomes dead to the sin problem. And now the righteousness and the life of Christ has come into your soul and controls every aspect of your life. Amen. Some people do not like the scripture that I chose this morning. But if you understand the options that we have here and the spirit in which Christ is uttering these things to the seventh church, 
you recognize that this is the greatest solution you've ever heard in your life. Lukewarm works are not natural. Hot works are and cold works are. But lukewarm works are not natural. And Jesus is now telling us that Jesus is not telling us that sometimes we're cold and sometimes we're hot and that in between produces lukewarmness. Jesus is not saying that. Jesus is specifically saying that your works are neither hot nor cold. There is no mixture here, according to Scripture, of hot and cold. Jesus is saying, whenever the self-righteous flesh tries to produce the works of the Spirit, the result will always be, without exception, lukewarm works. Today, some are teaching that the solution to our situation, our lukewarmness, is that we need a revival in the church. And they defend their unbiblical speculation by quoting what Jesus said to the first church, Ephesus. Turn, you have to read this. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Verses 4 and 5. First church. Revelation chapter 2 of the seven churches. Ephesus. Verse 4. Jesus is speaking. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your land out of its place unless you repent. We are being taught today that what we need is a reformation in the church, a revival. And they're using Revelation 2, 4 and 5 that I just read to you. Whoever does that is distorting not only the grammar, but the context of Revelation 2, 4 and 5. Because nowhere in Scripture does Jesus ever say to the seventh church, you were once hot, but now you're cold. And mixing those two has caused you to become lukewarm. Jesus never says that to the seventh church. So what is the solution to all of this? How many of you still want to be, want for Jesus to return within your lifetime? Okay, let's go to solutions. I was giving a Bible study once, I didn't know it, to a Sunday school teacher. <coughs> and he said to me, when is Jesus coming back? And I told him, when the second half of the sixth seal is fulfilled. He said, what? I said, don't you, your Bible include the seals? Yeah. I said, well, where is the sixth seal? He said, I don't know. He said, look it up. Revelation chapter 6. I want for you to look it up. Revelation chapter 6. Let me read to you. Would you like for people to read to you? I love for my wife to read to me. Everything is done, prepared. Would you like for me to read to you? Say, yes. <laughs> I'm going to read to you. This is not a bedtime story. 
This is a wake-up story. Mm. Revelation chapter 6. See if this sounds familiar. Beginning with verse 12. Tell me if this has been fulfilled. Yes or no? And I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. We know that from seismologists that have told us there's never been an earthquake like the one that happened in Lisbon, where it was felt in several continents. I come from California. We have earthquakes there all the time. And people call each other when you have an earthquake, say, hey, did you feel the earthquake? No. Look, you're talking to someone that's in the next county. <clears throat> Not the next continent, the next county. No, we didn't feel it. Well, how bad was it? Pretty bad. This earthquake, November 1st, 1755, was felt in several continents. And I want to read it for yourself. Great controversy, page 304. Continue. And the sun became black as sackcloth, made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood. May 19, 1780. Verse 13. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. Have you ever seen stars fall? I have. But never has there been this out pouring of stars falling from the sky as took place in the east coast of the United States when the entire east coast of the United States saw the falling of stars. Look it up in your encyclopedia. Don't take my word for it. Question is, have verses 12 and 13 been fulfilled? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Now I'm going to read verse 14 for you and I want for you to tell me if this has been fulfilled. And the sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up. And every mountain and island were removed out of their places. Has that happened? No. 15, 16, and 17. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the commanders, and the rich, and the strong, and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves among the rocks of the mountains. 16. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the land. 17. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Has that happened? No. Would you like to know when it's going to happen? <clears throat> Let's read verses 1 and 2 of chapter 7. After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind should blow on the earth or on the sea or any tree. Two. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. Three. Saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. Again, Revelation is a very symbolic book. What does it mean sealing the bondservants on their forehead? It means that God has a generation of people that are not only want for Jesus to return within their lifetime, but they are subordinating themselves 100% to His will so that He can reproduce His character, which the Bible calls the glory of God, in each one of them. Let's take a look at our scripture reading in closing. Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, be zealous therefore and repent. Four very important words here. What does it mean when we, uh, a word in English begins with R-E? Re. Re. Furnish. Re. Store. What? Something is out of whack or not proper and so it's being redone. redone. Who's going to be the redoing? Do the redoing. Who is going to let him do the redoing? That's your and my choice. Discipline. Kind of strong term, but if you look, up, look it up in the original language, it means to instruct, to teach you. Do you like that? Is that a little softer? The next word is repent. The word 
word repent, if you look it up in your concordance, it means to make a U-turn. Change your way of thinking. Change your attitude. And finally, the word zealous. What kind of works do you want to experience in your life? Cold? Works of law? Or hot works? That's what the word zealous means. If you repent, Jesus says, I guarantee that I will produce hot works in you. That's what the word zealous means. Zealous. I believe that this is a very positive message and very crucial message. If the response to my original question is, how many of you want for Jesus to return within your lifetime? If that is the case, Jesus is ready to what? To restore you? Teach you? Instruct you? And all he's asking you to do is, would you please reconsider your thinking in the past? And I will produce hot works in each one of you. So that the world can see that this thing called the gospel really works. And you're allowing it to become a reality in your life. Now that I have you focused on me, Jesus says, now I'm ready to pour out the latter rain that will make all of this happen. And that is the choice that you and I have this morning. Do we want, not only in purpose, but are we ready to repent, make a U-turn, from our attitude and the direction that we've been going in, and let Jesus reproduce His character in us. And in so doing, hot works. Our closing hymn is number 316.
generation that has the privilege of bringing an end to life on this planet as we know it today. Help us to recognize that it is our privilege, anticipated blessing, but also our choice as to whether we will be that generation that will subordinate their wills to you. And let the world see that the works that you performed when you were here on this earth 2,000 years ago have become a reality in your people. We thank you for answering these requests because we ask them in Jesus' name. Amen.